The third quest was a, an expression Tom invented um, in the uh, late 80s when he was doing work on the historical Jesus. Uh, and it came, it was published in 1996. Fantastic book, Jesus and the Victory of God. Um, as I grew into historical Jesus studies, uh, there were a few options. There was the old liberal quest, and there was the Boltmanian side with his followers and those who kind of broke from him in what's called often the second quest. But I was always attracted to people like Joachim Jeremias, who was fighting against the post boltmanians And I loved uh, Ben Meyer in 1979 when he published his book, The Aims of Jesus. So there's always been some good critical uh, debate and controversy about the legitimacy of the second quest. And I was a part of that uh, controversial side. The, the third quest was essentially for me, let's explain Jesus in his Jewish context. Uh, it was not a, a debate about what's authentic and what's not authentic. There's not as much debate in the third quest that way. It's more, here's Jesus, this is what the Jewish world is like. And the Germans uh, even call a thing called the plausibility criterion. Uh, and that is, is this plausible in the Jewish world? And this counts uh, for some. And it used to be uh, that it's plausible in Judaism. Uh, well, it didn't count at all for the post boltmanians that Bob Funk is a part of in the Jesus Seminar. So uh, people who want to fight about what is his authentic and what is not, um, if that becomes their final, so the use of, of criteria to determine what really happened, um, and not doing that so much in the context of Judaism, uh, that's, that's more the second quest, the old uh, post boltmanians Started in 56 with a famous lecture by Ernst Kazemann. The third quest is much more positive. And in my book, Jesus and His Death, I, I pushed hard on criteria to see what it could show us. And so it bridges the third quest uh, with the second quest. But l let me back up and say, the third quest is primarily a positive understanding of Jesus in Judaism. But there are people who do criteria studies in that one as well. It's just not as radical as found in the second quest. Well, I would say a couple things here. First of all, the only people who think that we uh, were obsessed with sayings and what was authentic were the post boltmanians Jeremias always made a huge deal about the temp table fellowship with Jesus. And Schweitzer got in uh, to things other than Jesus' statements. So when Sanders, in 1982 or 83, in Jesus and Judaism, argued that we, we have to go to actions and not just sayings, um, he was pushing against a certain group of scholars who were not doing sayings, but there were others who were. And there was a famous book by Elizabeth Anscombe called Intention, uh, a lecture at, I think, at Oxford University. And she wrote uh, a book, uh, Intention, in which she says, if you want to know what a person's intent and mission and purpose was, the best thing to do is to find out what they did. And I believe that historical Jesus scholars, Jesus of the historic, or the scholars of the historical Jesus, have, have almost always worked with actions as well as sayings. But there was an obsession in the 60s and 70s as a result of Norman Parent, who's famous for developing the Boltmanian criteria. Uh, there was an obsession with determining which sayings were authentic and which weren't. And Sanders pushed against that and went to, obviously, the, what's called the cleansing of the temple uh, to find uh, an authentic action of Jesus that will open up for us uh, his intent and his mission and purpose. Um, the one point I would want to make about historical Jesus studies, I think they're dead. I've been a part of this since the mid-80s. And there was nothing like the heady days of the 90s 
to go to academic meetings, the annual meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature, and hear academic scholars propose one new idea about Jesus after another. It was, it was intoxicating. It was fascinating. And the multiplicity of views eventually wore down scholars into thinking, maybe this isn't going to achieve what it says. Last year, Dale Allison, I think one of America's finest scholars, who's at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, gave lectures at Duke University in which he basically said, uh, we, we can't do this anymore. We're, we're not getting anywhere. And one of the things that I came to the conclusion of, and when I worked on Jesus and his death, I worked on all the texts that were important for how Jesus understood his death for a purpose of studying and fashioning for myself method that I thought would work because I wanted to see what we could achieve. And it, it didn't achieve what I was hoping it would achieve. When I was all done, I spent a lot of time, most of a year, studying historiography. And I wrote that at the beginning of the book. I came to the conviction that historical Jesus studies do very little for the church. The church has framed how to understand Jesus in the Gospels with early eyewitnesses. Historical Jesus scholars are trying to get behind the Gospels to the real Jesus who differs from what the church believes. So the, the intent of the whole thing is to give us another Jesus, a fifth Gospel, as it were. This is not what the church has believed. And I don't think the argument is we believe whatever the church says. It's that the church has framed four different Gospels, and then we have the apostles who articulate Jesus, and the, the idea of getting behind it to a Jesus of our own making is simply going to yield one different Jesus after another. It's, it's pretty hard to predict, but I think that leadership w will always be connected to charismatic or, or to you know, charisma. So the people who have the charisma will get to be the leaders. But I do believe that the next generation will want to be more involved in the central decisions made by a church and want things to be a little bit more open and transparent. So I would say there will be an increase in church congregations of a more democratic, open, transparent process. Um, I think there's going to want to be more ownership and leadership by lay people and less top-down uh, authority. Now that's right now, I think, is the, uh, the suspicion this is what the young people are saying they want. And so I'm, re I'm ready to listen. I'm just, let's see what happens. But I've been around churches long enough. You know, I've been act very active in churches for, for 35 years or more. And my contention is church work is exceedingly difficult. Pastoral leadership is a demanding and challenging task, vocation. And my suspicion is that people will see the wisdom of centralization and leadership and will learn to trust that good leaders are trustworthy leaders. So I, I, I think that the hope of a more democratized form of church government could come, appear. I think time will wear people down to where they realize, um, I like having a senior pastor who does the sermons he can look after these decisions and will participate in the callings that God has given us. So for 2,000 years, churches have largely operated the same way. And I suspect that this, this type of, of structure will continue.